And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection, I'm your host, Robert Picto. Our show today comes to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Simshan people. Stigma is when someone sees you in a negative way because of your mental illness. Discrimination is when someone treats you in a negative way because of your mental illness. Social stigma and discrimination can make mental health problems worse and stop a person from getting the help that they desperately need. On today's Open Connection, we continue our series on mental health. Greetings. My name is Dave Richardson, and I'm proud to be the co-founder and chairman of the Stigma-Free Society. I'm absolutely committed to the belief that we need to bring down the stigmas that exist in our schools, our workplace, and our community so that people that are dealing with mental health challenges or mental illness can get the help they need and can be embraced by their friends, their family, their colleagues, and they can heal because stigma about mental health is probably one of the most damaging and fundamental issues that we have in helping people address their mental health needs. Stigma exists in our society in so many ways. It's not just about mental health. It's about rage that exists learned from our parents. It's about messages that are coming down from political office. We have to become more compassionate as a society. We have to make a difference, not only in our own lives, but in everyone's lives around us. 20 minutes watching the news is a frightening experience. There's so much hate in the world. And if we are going to deal with the bigger issues, like climate and all the other things that exist, we're going to have to work together. I grew up in the city of Winnipeg. I had the good fortune, albeit a double-edged sword, to grow up in a very successful, noted, and recognized family. That certainly had its advantages, to be sure. On the other hand, it set me up to be bullied. Kids who just had something inside them that said that they had to pick on somebody, I was a good target. From about grade four, I was badly bullied. And I understand the damage that it can do to children. It wasn't easy, but I think that it's become part of the fabric of who I am. It's probably why I became an entrepreneur, because I wanted to make a difference. I know now, having got to the far side of stigmatizing myself, that I had to come to understand who I was and that the depression, at times anxiety that I dealt with my entire life was something that was just part of me. And I had to get over stigmatizing myself about taking medication. If I'd had a heart problem or high blood pressure or thyroid or anything else, I'd have had no hesitation taking medication. But my head, that was a problem. And I think that problem was probably generational. Nobody talked about mental health back when I was growing up. I'm old enough to remember when cancer was, it's, it's the C word, Shh. cancer, don't say anything. And now when someone has cancer, they share it with their friends and colleagues. They're embraced by their friends, by their family, by the community. And it's so vital to helping people deal with their illness, come to terms with 
what they're living with and find the inner strength to fight against something which is going on in our body. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thank you for staying with us. Research from the National Survey of Mental Health Literacy and Stigma shows that common misconception about how society views anxiety is that most people believe anxiety is a sign of personal weakness. Let us return the conversation with Dave Richardson. We have to bring mental health to the same level. We've got to put it out on the table. It's got to be a safe subject. I was on holidays with my wife and I was scheduled to fly home four days before her. I've traveled the world, Northern China, all through Europe, Africa, India. I've traveled extensively from a young age and I never had a problem going anywhere at any time. But I had to get her to fly home with me because I was afraid to go through Heathrow Airport by myself. I couldn't do it because my anxiety went right off the scale. I decided I wanted to be the best I could be for my friends, my family, my coworkers, and me. I now joke that I keep a two month supply of my medication on hand at all times. Why? Because when they put me in the pine box, it doesn't matter if I'm going north, more likely south, I'm gonna enjoy the journey. No withdrawal throughout the voyage because I want a better life. And if taking a little medication is what makes the difference, but I'm okay. And I'm better than okay because I've come to terms with the stigma that is so prevalent in our society about dealing with mental health. How do we address the issue of stigma? How do we open ourselves up or how do we create an understanding community around us that will accept us for who and what we are? We didn't choose to be who and what we are. Could be genetics, could be social environment, could be the part of the world and the community that we're brought up in. It really doesn't matter, except for the fact that we have to make the best of what we've got, where we've been, and who we are. I'm really challenged by the negativity that's in the papers, on the television, rampant in the news. Protests, fighting, anger, hate, animosity, lack of tolerance for other people who have a right to be on this planet with us. Nobody has any more right than anyone else. And we have to find a way to live together because there are far bigger issues and challenges facing this planet than somebody's color or race or religion. We have to do better. We have very, very big global issues to deal with if we're going to continue to exist on this planet. And fighting amongst ourselves is just not productive. Hi there, I'm Maddie, and I am very excited to be here today sharing my story with you. I am going to be telling you my experience of being diagnosed with and living with bipolar disorder. Hi. I'm Mac, I'm 23, 
My pronouns are he, him, and today I will be talking to you about my journey with gender and mental health. Hello everyone, I'm Nathan Lehrman and I'm excited to present in front of you all awesome people today. My name is Tanfreet Parver and today I'll be sharing my story about body image and mental health. My name is Sarah Khan and I'm aware of many hats. I am a librarian, journalist, blogger, actress, and curve model. Hi everyone, my name is Joe Stunkin and I'm so thankful to be speaking with all of you wonderful students today. Learning about mental health and mental illness and listening to other people's struggles is the first step to living a more stigma-free life. The beginning of 2014 is when my anxiety really started to, to wind fast. I am transmasculine, which means my sex assigned at birth was female, but I didn't align with that. Truth is, I'm a person living with autism. What I just admitted to you all, I would have refused to say to my best friends last year because of my fear of revealing the label. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD. I became very cautious about my body image. What we see on social media, magazines, or TV is not real and it is impossible to achieve. I still have days where I feel that pressure to keep up and be perfect. But now I know that everyone's life goes at a different pace. No two people are the same. And instead of focusing on everyone else, I remind myself to take care of myself. I can let autism define me, or I can choose to define it. I want you to know that even if it may feel like you are all alone, you aren't. You can get through it, and you will find your people. Thank you. If you notice a friend acting differently at school, reach out to them and let them know that you're there to support them. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. A common misconception that people with invisible illness face is the phrase, you don't look sick. In most cases, this is because the disease often presents itself in symptoms that are not recognizable to the outside world. Let us rejoin the conversation with Mia Chateau. Okay, so my name is Mia Chateau. I'm a 19 year old college student. I study special education. So an accessibility advocate is someone who makes things more accessible and they're advocating for reducing stigma for making things making the world an easier place for everyone not just people with disabilities but people who use like strollers the curb cuts in the sidewalk are great for everyone who use wheels uh, wheelchair skateboard m mothers with strollers it's kind of creating everywhere accessible for everyone okay so growing up i don't actually have any memories until age nine um, from, that's because part of my disorder is amnesic barriers. Um, I, so I don't have any memories until like this body was aged nine. And then, you know, like my parents were decent people for the most part. And I was kind of like rebellious and didn't want to listen to anyone. Um, so I, I don't know what happened in childhood. I moved from England to Canada when I was five. Um, I started being really horsey at age seven. And that's like as far as my childhood goes, I think. That's all I remember. Um, so I have dissociative identity disorder, which is a dissociative disorder called by, caused by repetitive childhood trauma. And that can be anywhere from um, bullying at school to severe abuse, um, really anywhere in between. And this disorder was created by a child's mind to protect the child from the trauma that was happening. So for me, I have quite a few alters and they each have their own reason for existence. My role in the system is to do everyday life, to talk to people, to socialize, to make food, to do schoolwork. And others in the system, they have the role of holding the trauma and the feelings so it doesn't overwhelm me. Because in DID, if the host, which is me, the person who fronts the most, if the host knows about the severity of the trauma, there's a very, very high chance that it will completely overwhelm them and something bad could happen. So everyone in the system has a specific role and they're each their own person who have their own likes, dislikes, personalities, 
and they're very, very separate from each other. The states of self can't integrate and each state of self um, develops into their own person, essentially, and they, they all have different life experiences. So having dissociative identity disorder, there's a lot of missing gaps in my day. Um, that's part of maybe something I, I can't handle is showering. That's something that I just don't do. So I will go go back into the headspace. I just, my consciousness will leave my brain essentially. And someone else's will pop into the front and shower. And when I am not in this body talking, doing things, essentially time doesn't, I don't have any concept of time. I'm basically asleep. And sometimes I can be missing chunks from a couple of seconds to months, years even. I've learned that the people who don't support you, who don't love you are not your people. And as hard as it is to remove yourself from those people, it's going to be for the best as much as it hurts and as horrible as it's going to feel. Those aren't the people that are gonna love you unconditionally because you're perfect no matter no matter what. And although it'll take some time to find your people, once you find the people who love you and support you no matter what, you're gonna become a really beautiful person. No matter all the bad stuff that's happened, no matter what people have said about you, you're like absolutely amazing. And the friends you surround yourself with, your true friends will support you no matter what. Um, and I've had some friends who have drifted apart because dissociative identity disorder can be super scary for people um, who are friends with someone who has that. They're, they don't wanna be around people who have dissociative identity disorder. There's a lot of stigma around it with um, like the stigma surrounding, if you have dissociative identity disorder, you're a bad person, you're going to hurt other people. Thank you, Canada. We have ourselves, oh, we have quite a lot. Thank you all for creating positive change for youth and families. Jimmy Gwetch, Marcy, for helping to create positive change for mental health. Let's continue to work together to promote positive mental health and well-being. Ensemble, nous continuons de créer un changement positif pour la santé mentale. Together, let's keep creating positive change for mental health. On vous remercie infiniment. Shukran. Thank you, Canada. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Tom Hanks played six different characters in Cloud Atlas. Eddie Murphy played seven in The Nutty Professor. And Alec Guinness notched up eight in Kind Hearts and Corsets. In this final segment of Open Connection, Mia shares how Hollywood sometimes spreads misinformation. You know, there's a movie Split, and it's a horrible movie about someone who has dissociative identity disorder or multiple personalities, and they're abusing three young girls. But when in reality, people with dissociative identity disorder are more likely to be abused than abuse other people. Um, but I've got some really good friends now. Um, so I have now a couple of good friends who have dissociative identity disorder and other people who are just normal people. And they're like, yeah, that's cool. They just adjust, go with the flow. If a little altar comes out, they're like, hey, what's up? Let's go get candy. If someone who's a little bit more mature, who's, um, has, you know, isn't a fan of doing this thing, they'll go off and we'll do something else. And it's really nice, um, but it was really hard finding those people and it was really scary opening up to those people and going, hey, I've got this disorder. If this happens, please do this, 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 and this. And it's like, it takes a lot of trust on like both of, both sides. Like my friend has to trust that we're not gonna do anything and that they're gonna stay safe. And we have to trust that they're not going to tell other people. So I think one of the biggest things when I became open about having dissociative identity disorder, I actually put a video up on YouTube and I was like, hey, this is what this disorder is. This is how it affects me. And I got posted on an illness faking Facebook page and people were saying, there's no way you can have that disorder. You don't look like you have it. There's no way someone your age could have that disorder. It's too rare to have it. Um, someone said my alters seemed fake and I was reading these comments and I was going that's a bias anyone of 
any age can have this disorder alters other own people. They're not they're not role played or anything like that. And I was just reading these comments and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna take this video down now because I was getting some nasty, nasty comments about about just things about this disorder that wasn't true. And people were saying there's no way she could have that disorder because if she actually had it, she wouldn't be able to function. And that's a pretty big, I guess, like misnomer stigma around it that if you have a severe mental illness, you can't function at all and you can't live a normal life. But it's very much not true. Where are you at now your life? You can dissociate and hold on. That's okay. It's okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Can we clear? Sorry. Thanks, but I don't want to give you kisses right now. You're being a part of Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Come here. It's okay. Did you want to spot him? No, I'm good. Okay, I take on time. Yeah, dissociating. You know when it happens, eh? Yeah, it's really easy to um, identify when it's happening because everything gets like super blurry and like I can like move my arms but I feel like I'm not connected to my body. Essentially, it's just when your brain disconnects from your body and it's really weird. Oh. Can you back up? Can you hop up? Can you hop up? He's like, no. You don't you fit. Need a hug. Can you give me a kiss? Thank you. Kiss? One kiss. Uh, I really do not want to switch in the middle of this. It's okay. Me. Oh my gosh. It's okay. <laughs> do you want a step tool? Mm. It's like all day. This pose so Yeah, he's like, you're dissociating. Let me ground you. Thank you. So this is one of the things he's trained to do is tactile stimulation. And he'll he'll do that until he feels like I'm more with it. It's very helpful. Usually he'll lick my face, which I find it a lot more grounding. I was like, okay, I think I think you're good. Are we good? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. I do. Good boy. As bad as it is right now, and as bad as you might feel right now, it will get better eventually. It's not going to happen quickly, and it's going to be really, really hard to get better and to make things better, but eventually it will be better and things will be okay. And it'll all be okay one day. As terrible as right now seems, there's a lot worth living for, even if everything seems really terrible. The one thing that really does help me is connecting back to my culture. Today I'm trying to get outside and, and enjoy the weather. Give a call to my distant family, tell them that I love them. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind and heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Picton. <laughs>